Thank you, uh, John. Thanks everyone this morning. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, lovely to see you all here this morning. And uh, John started our service off, didn't he, showing us all those, those pictures of how we might be feeling this morning. And uh, it's fair to say, I think, and we've seen this over the last few weeks in our own fellowship, and, and the prayers, Rachel's prayers sum this up. There's lots of requests for prayer, isn't there? That people react uh, to troubles and difficulties, to adversity in lots of different ways. For some, it's poor me, and they seek everyone's comfort and, and attention. Some people don't want others to know, actually, and will keep it to themselves and, and suffer in silence. Some people crumble. Anxieties and fears flood in. Others find strength from somewhere and remain stoical throughout it all. For some, it's, it's why me? What have I done to deserve this? For others, it's a more perhaps fatalistic, well, why not me? It had to happen sometime. There's all sorts of ways, aren't there, that people react to adversity. So what about you? And as a Christian, does your faith make any difference as to how you might handle adversity? And what does the Bible say about it? Well, we've been looking at 1 Peter over these last uh, few months, certainly before Easter, and also some other texts under the title of Freedom and Confidence in Difficult Times. And we've spoken of confidence in the gospel that we have, We've spoken of our identity that we find in Christ. We've spoken of the relationships that we have with, with others of the faith, whether that's our family or church community and the strength that that gives us. And we've talked about the confidence we have in our witness because of all these things. And the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the freedom and confidence we get from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a freedom from guilt, a freedom from sin and death, and there's the promise of eternity. Now, now, we know all these things, don't we? We know that God is for us. And yet so often, when the rubber of adversity hits the road of our life, we struggle. And those fears and anxieties roll on in to our hearts. Now, Peter, Peter knew all about this. In his personal life, it was true. Remember his denying of, of Jesus and all that went with that. But also he's seen it in the life of the believers and churches that he's got some input into. And so in the concluding verses of his letter that Alan's read for us today, this, this letter written to encourage Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. Now there's adversity for you. He rams home his message of encouragement in difficult times with four simple commands which lead to one certain promise. And we'll look at those to say today. The first command is humble yourselves. That's verse 6 of 1 Peter chapter 5. Now we need to qualify that, humble yourselves. This isn't to, to belittle yourself unnecessarily. This isn't to become everyone's doormat. We need to hear the whole verse. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. You see, this is, this is about recognising who you are in relation to just one other person, the person of God. It's acknowledging his greatness and your smallness in comparison. It's about him being, being Lord and you being his servant. This is about him being king and you being a citizen in his kingdom. This is about him being the infinite Lord of all and you being a finite, mortal, insignificant blob on a tiny planet in a huge universe that he created and sustains, yet who loves you so much he sent his son to die for you, that you can call this awesome God your father in heaven. You see, there's no other response, is there, really, than humbleness. And the verse adds another dimension, because Peter says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Now, when you read the Old Testament in particular, you read of God's mighty hand at work in, in the creation and particularly in the deliverance of his people. So Exodus chapter 13, verse 9, for example, and it's one of many examples 
for the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You can find several other similar references. God's hand at work is often synonymous with the deliverance of his people. This is the kind of God he is. He's great, he's majestic, he's awesome, and he loves, he cares, he hears, he delivers his people. So, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. That he may lift you up in due time. Now let's just park that, let's hold on to that because a later verse unpacks it for us. So the sum of this verse, the sum of this command, things may be tough now. Your circumstances might be difficult now. But Peter's saying, don't bow down to your circumstances. Bow down to the one who controls your circumstances. Humble yourselves under his mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. And look, this isn't just a passive resignation to your fate. This is an active working with God through the difficulties until he brings you out on the other side. Romans 8, 28, so Paul says similar things, doesn't he? We know that in all things, every circumstance, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. There is purpose in your suffering good will come from this. We just need to trust God, humbling ourselves under his mighty hand. So the first command is to humble yourself. The second command is this, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now the second half of that sentence we've already established, he cares for you. But there's no harm in repeating it all together now. He cares for me. Say again, he cares for me. So cast all your anxiety on him. Cast it, throw it. The picture is one of those fishermen who, who go out in a small boat and, and cast their net on the water. It's quite a skill. Have you ever seen anybody do it or ever tried it yourself, perhaps? It takes practice to perfect. He throws, the net spins, the weights on the net bring it down squarely on the water. It sinks and it traps fish as the weights close around those fish. We have to cast our anxieties onto the Lord. It's a deliberate action. It doesn't happen automatically. I don't know, imagine it how you will. Gather your anxieties in your hands and, and throw them at God. Here you are, Lord. They're yours now. Oh, did I mention you have to let go? I read a story this week about a young lad who'd been sent to the store to get a sack of grain. This is probably a few years ago, I suspect. It was heavy and he was struggling to carry this sack of grain on his shoulder. A passing cart stopped and the driver offered him a lift. The young lad muttered his thanks and climbed on board the cart, but he was still holding the sack of grain on his shoulder. And the driver said, why don't you put down the sack? And the lad said, oh, I don't want to give your horse any more weight to carry, so I'll carry it. He was getting help with his burden, but he wouldn't let go. When we cast our burdens on the Lord, we must let go. Otherwise, they're still our burdens. The, the Lord is strong enough to carry them for us. We don't need to worry about him. He can carry our burdens. And don't miss that little three-letter word in the sentence. Cast all your anxieties on him. Not some, all. Not bits of all. Do you get it? He cares for you. He wants to help. If we trust him, the burden of our anxieties will disappear. I probably should uh, define what we mean here. When you cast all your anxiety on him, the circumstances that are causing your anxiety might not change. 
but your anxiety about those circumstances belong to him. Sounds easy, doesn't it? I'm guessing that worries and anxieties come easy to most of us. Well, you know, we're not alone. It's been true of people right the way down through the ages. And, and the Bible has a lot to say about this throughout. In the Old Testament, Psalm 55, verse 22, a Psalm of David for use in worship. The instruction comes, cast your cares on the Lord. That sound familiar? And he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. And Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount, at Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. I won't read it all. Here's a summary. Don't worry. God will provide. The flowers in the field, the birds of the air, he provides. As good old Anon says, God is not out to break us, but to make us cast all your anxieties on him so the third command verse eight be self-controlled and alert now at first this might sound a, a bit discordant a bit of a jangling after these first two commands surely peter's telling us to to relax to to chill out to to not worry to to roll with it and now we have to be self-controlled and alert? Well, yes. Let's read the rest of the verse. Be self-controlled and alert, for your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I wonder whether Peter's reflecting back on his experiences with Jesus, particularly on the night that Jesus was arrested, the night before his crucifixion and, and they went to the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus takes Peter and James and John with him into the heart of the garden and then goes on himself to pray and he asks them to stay and keep watch and you know what happened they fell asleep and three times Jesus prays and returns and three times when he returns they're asleep and his words to them are this watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Peter knew what it was to give in to his bodily urges and not keep watch. And here he reminds us that we have a, a spiritual enemy. And the goal of this enemy is to hinder us from being the kind of disciples that will make a difference in the world. And he employs all sorts of tricks. So, so temptations to lure us off the straight and narrow, like, like Peter in Gethsemane. Like lies about God and ourselves that raise doubts in our mind and cause us to hesitate in doing good. Or perhaps he plants worries and fears and anxieties in our heads and hearts to to blunt our effectiveness and our witness now that's all i'm going to say about the enemy i'm not going to big him up yes the verse describes him as a roaring lion prowling around for someone to devour but let me tell you something about this enemy this lion he's defeated he may make some noise with his roaring but but look closely He's got no teeth or claws. Jesus has removed them on the cross. And what's that around the lion's neck? It's a chain. Jesus has tethered him. He can only prowl around so far. He's limited in what he can do. And he can only do what God allows him to do. Think, think Job and that whole opening chapter about how the devil has to um debate with with god and god allows these things think think peter actually luke chapter 22 and verse 31 and jesus said to him simon simon peter peter satan has asked to sift you as wheat but i pray what did jesus pray that, that satan wouldn't that, that he would leave him alone no that you can stand strong against his wiles that your faith will not fail 
look, the only harm, the only way this lion can do any harm is if you go and play with him. If you give him a foothold in your life, if you yield to those temptations, if you believe his lies, you know the kind of lies? You're not good enough to do this. Did God really say that? Call yourself a Christian. Don't give in to those lies. Don't believe those lies. And don't embrace the worry or the anxiety or the doubts that he raises in your mind. This is why we need to be self-controlled and alert, to spot the wiles of the devil and to walk around them and through them with Jesus. And it leads us to this fourth command in verse 9, which is this simply, resist him, standing firm in the faith. You see, we don't need to give in to the enemy. It's possible to resist him because Jesus has defeated him and removed his power from him. Jesus showed us how to resist the devil. Again, when Peter was involved, remember how, how Jesus told his disciples that, that he must suffer and be handed over to the authorities and that he must die and be raised again on the third day? And Peter, remember Peter, good old Peter? Never, Lord. And Jesus said to him, oh, thanks, Peter. No, he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God at heart, but the things of man. This is a useful phrase for when we hear the roar and sense the wiles of the enemy. Get behind me, Satan. Let's repeat that. Get behind me, Satan. Resist him. It's interesting that, that James actually in his letter in one verse sums up all that we've said so far in this sermon. Chapter 4 and verse 7 of James's letter. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It was C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Letters who said that there are two equal and opposite errors that Christians fall into concerning this enemy. One is to ignore him and pretend that he doesn't exist. The other is to glorify him and give him too much credence. Peter's way, therefore, is a healthy middle ground. Trust in God, that's the first and foremost thing, but be self-controlled and alert. Cromwell famously told his troops, trust in God, but keep your powder dry. Walk in trust and confidence under God's mighty delivering hand, but watch out for the wiles of the evil one who seeks to trip you up. So resist him and stand firm in the faith. You see, your faith in Jesus Christ, it rests on solid ground. It, it's rock, not sand. There are so many promises of God and so many words of encouragement in Scripture. Remember how Jesus resisted the devil in his 40 wilderness days? By quoting Scripture and standing fast on the promises of God. And we too can do this. And Peter adds, uh, resist him, stand firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers and sisters or the family of believers, I think, in the modern version throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And this could mean a couple of things and probably means both these things. Firstly, take heart from knowing that others are suffering too. You're not alone in this. You must be doing something good if the devil is out to stop you. And resist the devil, stand firm in the faith, so be an example to your fellow sufferers that they will stand fast too. I haven't warned Mike Wells about this, uh, but one of the early patients I saw as a chaplain at the hospital was Mike Wells' father, Guy. He'd been diagnosed with a prostate cancer and had uh, tried some therapy. But the next treatment may have extended his life by a few months, but the quality of his life would have suffered with the effects of that treatment. And Guy decided to refuse the treatment, arguing that if the Lord was calling him home, 
then why should he hinder that? He was going to a better place. I can't tell you how powerful that, that was to me as a, as a chaplain in my early days there. Most people, of course, not wanting to die. Most people fearing death. And that kind of response that, that Guy took, that decision that he took, it just makes you ask questions, doesn't it, of, of yourself. If I was in the same place, how would I face death? How will I face death? Because sure as eggs is eggs, one day it will happen. My faith tells me that to live is Christ and to die is gain. My faith tells me that heaven is the goal of my faith and it's my true home anyway. I know that, but when that moment comes, will doubts and fears creep in? Will I seek to prolong my life at all costs? Actually, how firm a foundation is my faith to my life? How will I respond to adversity? Well, Peter's given us these four simple imperative commands. Humble yourselves. Cast all your anxieties on him, be self-controlled and alert, and resist the devil. And here comes the one certain promise in verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. Remember in verse 6 when I said, let's hold on to that, it gets unpacked later. Verse 6 was that he may lift you up in due time. Now in verse 10, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. This is an honest verse, isn't it? There may, there will be suffering in our lives. God has never promised us a rose garden. Along with the sunshine, there has to be a little rain sometime. And it's unrealistic to expect otherwise. James, in his letter again, calls his readers to, to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete lacking nothing and peter echoes these words here we need some rain in our lives for the flowers to bloom but after this suffering peter brings this promise from god he will restore you the word there is used for for mending nets for, for setting a fracture properly roger by the way not just you know not just badly but properly setting a fracture for, for making you whole again he'll make you strong he'll establish you he'll harden you like a metal that is tempered by fire <laughs> he'll make you firm that that's that's fit not flabby he'll make you steadfast he'll lay your foundations he'll give you this bedrock of faith to stand on You'll be able to sing along with the seekers. Remember them? Apologies to anyone under the age of 60. We're on our way to heaven. We shall not be moved. To live is Christ. To die is gain. That's the promise. If we follow those simple commands. Peter rounds off the letter, these verses, with a doxology. To him be the power forever and ever to God be the power forever and ever amen it's not quite the end of the letter he tags on greetings and another command to greet one another with a kiss of love something we'll be able to do hopefully in a few short weeks when we're all back in church and then there's this final blessing peace to all of you who are in Christ and you know that's the sum of it all if we are in Christ if we've put our trust in him, if we've given our hearts and lives to him, if we've invited him to be our personal saviour, if we belong to him, then there is peace in him, whatever the circumstances. Not anxiety, not worry, not wavering, not weakness, but strength and peace from the God of all grace. To him 
be the power forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words. Lord, we thank you again, Lord. We stand in awe of how your word speaks into our lives, time after time, sentence after sentence, word after word, and speaks, Lord, right into our hearts and gives us, Lord, uh, uh, that newness of faith, that that reminder, Lord, of your promises and, and your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your strength, of your power that's at work in our lives. Help us, Lord, to, to do these simple things, Lord, and to uh, humble ourselves before you, to cast, Lord, our anxieties onto you. And to watch out, Lord, that we don't get tripped up and fall along the way. Thank you, Lord, for this promise that you will restore us. And we trust in you, Lord, that whether in this life or in the next, Lord, we stand strong in you. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Amen.